the guest. Now time for a question period. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I have uh, several questions for you today regarding Liberal priorities. As critic for health and long-term care, I get letters from Ontarians across the province who are not getting the health care they need. Janice from Chatham writes me that she was scheduled for a knee replacement in 2012. Due to funding cuts, her surgery was delayed until 2013. And now, because funding for orthopedics has run out altogether, she now won't have her surgery until 2014. Shame. Forgive me, Premier, but I have trouble understanding your government's priorities. When it comes to Liberal seats, you have billions of dollars to spend. When it comes to Ontarians, you're out of money. The NDP may have to solicit advice on how to hold you responsible, but we think that this is just plain wrong. Question? Premier, on the basis of this, with prior priorities like this, do you think that you've earned the right to govern? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me talk just a little bit about what our budget would do in the area of health care, Mr. Speaker, if it were to pass. It would increase investment in home and community care by an additional 1% annually, Mr. Speaker, $260 million this year and an increase of more than $700 million by 2015-16. That's a priority, Mr. Speaker. It is our priority that people get the care that they need in their home and in the community, Mr. Speaker. We're going to focus on new investments providing uh, care in community to reduce those home care wait times, Mr. Speaker, because not only do we want patients, people to get care in their homes, we want them to get it in a timely way, Mr. Speaker. We're going to invest in community health links, Mr. Speaker, that will promote collaboration in uh, patient care so that patients have one unified yes, care plan, Mr. Speaker. Those are priorities that I think will make the health care system in Ontario stronger, Mr. Speaker. Thank I you. think it's a priority that the member opposite should support. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Premier talks about spending more money in health care, but what I'm hearing from people across the province is that General come to order. cuts in health care. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. Here's an excerpt from another letter I've received. My husband is battling a deadly brain tumor, and we as a family have struggled for almost two and a half years. A medication approved by Health Canada in March of 2010 for treatment is not provincially funded under the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, but is available in the provinces of British Columbia, Saskatchewan <coughs> and Manitoba. Dana from Bell River, Ontario, has difficulty understanding why she has to cash in her life savings in order to provide her husband with the medication he needs. Premier, I also have trouble understanding when your government clearly has billions on hand to save Liberal seats why you can't spend money to save Question. a woman's husband's life. So, Premier, I'll ask you again. Do you do you think that your government that prioritizes saving a few seats over saving the lives of Ontarians has earned the right to govern? Thank you, Premier. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me just let me just say that it is obviously our highest priority that we provide the best care possible for all the individuals that the member opposite has named and for all Ontarians. That is, that is the focus of the health care system, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that we are in the process of transforming that system. And it's very interesting to me that a member of a party that has said government has to change, implement the recommendations of the, uh, the report that Don Drummond wrote, Mr. Speaker, change government so that it works better that the moment we try to do that mr. speaker when we actually transform the area of the largest expenditure in government which is health care mr. speaker and that means change in the delivery of services that party stands up and says mr. speaker well we don't want that kind of change we don't want change that's going to make health care make the health care system more effective and more efficient mr. speaker it really is a contradiction in terms I hope that the member opposite will reconsider and support Thank our you. changes. Final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, the only real change we're seeing is continued cutbacks in health care and no accountability for the money that's being spent. That's right. Like many Ontarians, I have difficulty understanding how your government can continue to underfund orthopedic surgery, drag your heels on approving life-saving drugs, cut physiotherapy services for seniors by $44 million, but it's got a billion dollars on hand to cancel gas plants. Premier, we're not the NDP. We think these priorities are wrong, whether you set up a financial accountability office or not. Do you think it's right when your government prioritizes the Liberal Party over the life-saving needs of the people of Ontario?
Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I think is not right is to mischaracterize changes that are being made in order to deliver service in a better way, in a more timely way. And I'll just use one example, Mr. Speaker, the physiotherapy issue. We are changing the way physiotherapy will be delivered in the province. And that will mean, Mr. Speaker, that more seniors will get access to those services, Mr. Speaker, because the model that was in place was not working. It does mean that there's a change, and there is always some disruption when there's a change, Mr. Speaker. But we will continue to invest in services that will improve health care for people. And no matter how many times, no, many, no matter how many times the member opposite talks about cuts, the only party in this house, Mr. Speaker, that would slash public services that would cut across the top, Mr. Speaker, and change services irrevocably in this province is the Conservative That's Party, right. Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, between the member from Nepean Carleton and me, we asked you 32 times when you knew the tab for Oakville uh, was more than $40 million and the bill for Mississauga was more than $190 million. Uh, sadly, we don't have that answer. I use those numbers because you and others have repeated them in the legislature over and over. But neither you nor the former Premier would answer that one burning question, when? Premier, is the reason you won't tell us when you knew the costs were higher than you reported? Because that would prove you and your entire cabinet would be held in contempt in this House. There it is. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I guess this is the 33rd time that I'm answering this question, Mr. Speaker. And I have said repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, that every time, every time I used a number, it was a number that had been given to me through the Ministry of Energy member from, from the Halton OPA, Mr. Speaker, and it was the number that I understood to be the reality. Mr. Speaker, I answered these questions at committee. I have taken responsibility for improving the uh, process going forward and planning of large energy infrastructure projects, Mr. Speaker. That is what we need to do going forward. I have opened up this process. I wrote to the, the Auditor General. I asked him to look at the Oakville situation, Mr. Speaker. I worked to broaden the mandate of the committee so that all questions and all documents could be requested, Mr. Speaker. We, we have worked very hard to make this an open and transparent process so that all the questions Answer. of the opposition and the people of Ontario could be answered. The process did not work. It should have been better, and it is my responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you Speaker. Well, we still don't know when she will uh, knew the numbers were higher. So here's what the former energy minister, Chris Bentley, had to say about the hundreds of all uh, millions already spent in Oakville. Quote, over the coming days and weeks, you will read and hear lots of numbers related to the cost of plant relocation. The only minister accurate Kane, cost to the taxpayers to for this relocation is $40 million. Again on Oakville, your current energy minister said, Quote, it ends up with a net cost of $40 million. But, Speaker, the energy experts are telling us it's at least $310 million, and, Premier, you knew the number you're using is wrong. You can't be trusted to govern. Will you support our motion to call a non-confidence vote in the House on your scandal seize Liberal government? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier? Government House Leader. Oh. It's all about your there it is. You, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member is aware that the Premier has personally asked the Auditor General and Officer of the Legislature to look into the matter of the costing for Oakville. But you know what I find very curious, Mr. Speaker, is he's talking about questions that have not been answered. Mr. Speaker, let me, let me put a few on the table that we're still awaiting the Progressive Conservative Party to answer. Why did they oppose the Mississauga gas plant in the last election? Why did they campaign so aggressively, and what was their costing? Mr. Speaker, I do not believe those are overly complicated are questions, committee? and yet, Mr. Speaker, when we ask Conservative candidates to come before committee, they refuse. Oh, when we ask the Leader of the Opposition,
motion. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks for him to show up, Mr. Speaker. What I find, someone pointed out to me that the leader of the opposition, Carlton, come to order. The leader of the opposition seems to be able to find lots of time to go on CP24 and talk yes, about sir. gas plants, but he won't appear in front of the committee and answer those simple questions. So maybe the member Thank from Nipissing will in his supplement. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Listen to what former Finance Minister Dwight Duncan had to say uh, in the Estimates Committee about the $180 million at that time Mississauga cancellation. He was asked, quote, what about any penalties? He answered, quote, none that we're aware of. Question, quote, so you're not expecting anything else over the, at that time, $180 million on Mississauga? Any additional claims or penalties? Answer, quote, no. The $180 million should cover all of that. Now, of course, his answer grew to $190 million a week later, and we know now from the auditor that at the time they were swearing that in the Estimates Committee, the auditor told us they'd already paid $245 million. Premier, you know the costs were more than $190 million. Question. I'll ask you again. Will you support the motion to bring a non-confidence vote on your failed leadership? Mr. Yes, Speaker, the honourable member wants some quotes. The only party that will stop the Sherway power plant is the, the Ontario PC Gray, Party. Come to order. On October 6, vote Ontario PC. Marianne de Monte Whalen. And you know what was interesting, Mr. Committee. Speaker? We asked her to come to committee. She's she done. agreed to come to committee, and surprisingly, at the last minute, she cancelled, Mr. Speaker. We asked the Leader of the Opposition to come. I understand now he may be there on the 14th. It's taken week after week after week. He finds time to go on CP24. He doesn't find time to go on the committee. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you about Jeff Yanisik. Let me see you tell you about Jeff Yanisik. Here's what some of his quotes. Only Conservative leader Tim Hudak will cancel the Eastern Answer. Power gas plant slated to be built on Warland Map. We asked him repeatedly come to the committee, Mr. Speaker. He told the clerk, stop calling him, Mr. Speaker. That's Thank you. See you, please. New question? The member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. New Democrats have been very clear that we needed to see a balanced approach to balancing the budget. And we also uh, need, we insisted on seeing real guarantees of results for people. People are telling us that they doubt the government will keep its promises because the government won't define how long people are going to have to wait for home care for their loved ones. Or the government won't define how long drivers will have to wait to get a break on their auto insurance. They've seen decisions made behind closed doors by this government, and they feel like they almost always come out on the losing end. Does the Premier agree that we can do better, a better job of showing Ontarians their government can be accountable and transparent? Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and you know, the, the leader of the third party um, yesterday, I guess, put forward an interesting idea. But I really believe that uh, it would be useful for me to be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the uh, with the leader of the third party. I've been trying to get that in place, Mr. Speaker, for a number of weeks, and have a conversation about you know exactly the other issues that she wants to uh, that she wants to raise. But, Mr. Speaker. We have, we have put in place a number of accountabil accountability measures since we came into office, and you know, we, can go through a, we can go through a list of them. The Broader Public Sector Accountability Act in 2010, Mr. Speaker, which put in new rules on higher accountability standards, it banned the practice of hiring lobbyists, increased accountability for hospitals and LINs. We put in the, the Fiscal Transparency and, and Accountability Act 2004, Mr. Speaker, which, which put in a new framework for the conduct of fiscal policy. So, Mr. Speaker, Thank We've you. got accountability measures in place. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Ontarians and the, even the members of this caucus want to trust this government. But after the, all the waste in e-health, in Orange, the gas plants, the ongoing attempts to hide the costs from Ontarians, no one over there should be surprised that many people are very skeptical. New Democrats put forward a simple 
positive and practical idea that would start to build trust, a financial accountability office that would create some real accountability and transparency. Is this an idea the Premier is ready to consider? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Said it's an interesting idea, Mr. Speaker. I had uh, a number of conversations with the leader of the third party before we introduced the budget, Mr. Speaker. We talked with hundreds of thousands of people across the province in developing the budget, Mr. Speaker. We, we went to great lengths to make sure that we, we wrote a budget that reflected the concerns that we had heard and reflected issues that are of common interest to us all, Mr. Speaker. That's what the budget document is. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to have another conversation with the leader of the third party about another idea. The question is, will there be another idea and another idea and another idea, Mr. Speaker? We've gone through a long process, and you know that I am not averse to conversations, but there is a time for decisions, Mr. Speaker. The time is now to make a decision on getting the budget passed and doing the work of the people of Ontario. That's what the timing is now, Mr. Speaker. Our priority over here should always be the people of this province, and we're not going to stop listening to what they have to say, whether it's today or tomorrow or the next day. Canada's first federal bud budget officer told reporters yesterday that a financial accountability office for Ontario makes a lot of sense. And I quote him, we're spending taxpayer money. I don't think anybody should be left in the dark, end of quote. One Ontario resident named Marilyn from North Bay says, and I quote her, I am not happy with what the Liberals have done with eHealth, the power plants, or Orange, and find the payouts to CEOs to be obscene. There needs to be independent oversight, end of quote. Is the Premier ready to take some prudent, affordable steps to address the concerns of people Question. like Marilyn? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And there are a number of prudent steps in the budget, Mr. Speaker, that are address concerns of people in the province, people who are worried about their their son or daughter not being able to find a job, Mr. Speaker. We've put in place a youth strategy. We would like to put in place a youth strategy if the budget could pass. People who are concerned about getting home care for their children, Mr. Speaker. Municipal leaders who are concerned about having money for infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, for roads and bridges. All of those concerns are reflected in the initiatives that we have put in the budget and that we talked about with the people, with the uh, members opposite, before we wrote that budget. I have said that the, uh, the uh, idea that the uh, leader of the third party has put forward is not a bad idea. It's an interesting idea. It's something that we can talk about. But, Mr. Speaker, we we need to know how long the ideas are going to flow. Answer. How many days are we going to hear an idea a day? And then what is the decision-making process? I'd like to have a face-to-face -face meeting, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to Thank that you. opportunity in the near future. Thank you. Real question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday at the Public Accounts Committee, we heard more testimony about public health care dollars being diverted to private businesses and to creative accounting practices at Orange. Does this Premier admit that there's a serious failure of oversight and transparency at that organization? Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've said. Uh long ago that it's clear that the, the past leadership at Orange led Ontarians down. You know, the, uh, it was our government that called in the forensic investigators, Mr. Speaker. The results of the, re the review have now been handed over to the OPP to assist with their investigation. And yesterday's testimony at committee reinforced the decision that uh, our government made to bring in new leadership, Mr. Speaker, and enact measures to increase transparency and accountability. So we absolutely agree that there was a, a failure of leadership in the, uh, the uh, orange uh, situation, Mr. Speaker. Patient safety is our number one priority. That's why we've introduced legislation that would increase oversight. That legislation is at committee, Mr. Speaker, and we'd like, to see, we'd like to see the Air Ambulance Act go ahead, Mr. Speaker, and I hope that the party opposite will work with us on that. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you Mr. Speaker. In tough times, people want to see their scarce and precious health care dollars invested into frontline services. Yet the scandal at Orange shows very clearly that those public health care dollars were spent on CEO salaries to build private businesses and even to purchase ski boats. 
The government has insisted that they didn't know what was happening at Orange. But does the, gov does the Premier admit that there's a serious systemic failure with respect to accountability and transparency at that organization and in this government? Mr. Speaker, I said clearly, and uh, our Minister of Health has said clearly, that there was a serious issue of oversight at Orange, that the past leadership failed to deliver, uh, to deliver what Ontarians needed in terms of service and accountability. That did not work, Mr. Speaker, and that's why the legislation that we've introduced would appoint special investigators or a supervisor when it's in the public interest to do so, similar to the situation and the process we have in hospitals, Mr. Speaker, would appoint members to Orange's board. Board of Directors would prescribe terms of the performance agreement, Mr. Speaker, between government and Orange and put that in regulation, and would provide whistleblowing protection for staff who have disclosed information to an inspector, investor, supervisor, or ministry. Mr. Speaker, that's why we brought the legislation in. Because there was a failure of leadership at Orange, we have said quite clearly that the, the past yes, leadership at, at Orange did not function in an appropriate way, and that's why we've taken action, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the problem is that the people of Ontario are very, are very skeptical about a government that struggles to invest in their priorities, but allows at the same time inside connector, and connected insiders to profit and get rich off of public money. The government has insisted that the public interest was protected at Orange, and it simply was not. Just like insiders were billing millions of dollars at eHealth, just like the government spent millions of dollars on cancelling gas plants, people are seeing a problem with this government. They want accountability. Is the Premier ready to consider that there are some tangible steps that we can take to afford some accountability and some transparency to the people of Ontario and consider the idea of having a financial accountability office? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I I, I, th I think this question goes to the, uh, the first question that the, uh, the third party asked, and that is the idea, of, uh, the idea that was put forward by the leader yesterday about uh, a new accountability officer. And, Mr. Speaker, I said that it's an idea that, uh, that we could look at, but, but in the context of the budget discussion, we need to know how long the list is of new ideas that will be coming forward from the NDP, because we have had a process, Mr. Speaker, that has led to the writing of this budget that was very different than the process last year, Mr. Speaker. This year, we spent a lot of time listening to what the third party said. We, we uh, had the opportunity to interact with 600, more than 600,000 people around the province, Mr. Speaker. I met with folks in communities across the province at 10 jobs and economy roundtables, Mr. Speaker. So there was a lot of work that was done in the lead up, and there is much in the budget yes, that reflects the common ground between us and the third party, and I would suggest between us and the Conservatives as well, Mr. Speaker. We need Thank a decision you. now. I'm happy to have that meeting with the leader Thank of the third part. New question, the member from Newmarket Aurora. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The incompetence and mismanagement of this government uh, goes from bad to worse, Speaker, and it's no more evident than in the Ministry of Health. At yesterday's Public Accounts Committee, we heard from Mr. Richard Jackson. He told us that he was hired to head up the minister's new air ambulance oversight program. When asked what experience he had in either air ambulance or land ambulance, he said none. He told us he hired six individuals into that department to help him with his oversight responsibilities. When asked how much experience those six staff members have in air ambulance or land ambulance, he said none. Can the Premier tell us who was responsible for hiring this group of inexperienced people to oversee the most critical oversight responsibilities in the Ministry of Health? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, so let's just, let's just uh, be clear about exactly what the member opposite is talking about. He's talking about the Air Ambulance Oversight Branch. And Mr. Speaker, there's another branch called the, the Emergency Health Services Branch. There is plenty of expertise in land and air ambulance operations in that branch, Mr. Speaker, the, the Emergency Health Services Branch. What the Air Oversight Branch is designed to do, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that 
transfer payment agencies are transparent, that they're accountable, that we get value for money when spending taxpayers' dollars, Mr. Speaker. I think that that's exactly the kind of expertise that the official opposition would want, Mr. Speaker, given what has transpired at Orange. So we need to be very careful that when we talk Answer. about the expertise that's needed, that we understand that there are different branches and that different expertise is needed depending Thank on you. the task at hand. Speaker, I think what's important is that the Premier familiarize herself with the Ministry of Health. There are not two branches. The Emergency Health Services branch is headed by the same person that heads the department within the Emergency Health Services branch, which is the Air Ambulance Program. It is the same person who has no experience in either land ambulance or air ambulance. The people who now are responsible for oversight of air ambulance have no experience in either land ambulance or air ambulance. My question back to the Premier is this. When will this Premier recognize and admit that neither the Ministry of Health has competent leadership at either the minister's level, the deputy minister's level, the associate deputy minister's level, or the assistant deputy minister who hired these inexperienced people to have this important, crucial oversight responsibility. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, the member, the member opposite has made my point that within the Ministry of Health there are different there's different expertise that's necessary, and what's important, Mr. Speaker, is that we have the right expertise performing the right function. I would ask the member opposite. He is so concerned about oversight, as are we, that he would work with us to get Bill 11 through committee, Mr. Speaker, to stop stalling that bill, Mr. Speaker. We need that legislation in place. We need that legislation to come back from committee, and the member opposite has a lot of control Order. over whether that happens. I know that his concern is genuine. I know that he wants to make sure that oversight is in place. So my hope is that he will work with his colleagues, will get Bill 11 back from, back from committee, and will be able to get that legislation Turn in place, because that's where the accountability measures are. My question is to the Premier. The government claims that uh, building high occupancy toll lanes could raise $250 million a year for transit. Yet there are no revenue projections in the budget, and the government won't say where the lanes will be built or where, where the toll will be. Metrolinx puts the initial revenue uh, from HOTs at $25 million and says the HOTs are not a significant source of revenue for transit. So, which is it? $25 million a year or $250 million a year? Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Minister of Tran Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. We are indeed in this budget extending HOV lanes in significantly according to our long-term plan, Mr. Speaker. This is so that families can get home and get to work, and we can enhance the quality of and better use our highways. But there are some interesting studies, Mr. Speaker, that have come out of Washington to California demonstrating the effectiveness of HOT lanes, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to look at this as an evidence-based process to enhance transit. But, Mr. Speaker, our Big Move plan builds 15 remarkably important, critical pieces of transportation infrastructure, LRTs, uh, bus rapid transit. It is the biggest single investment in the history of Ontario in public transit. It is already underway, Mr. Speaker, on the Eglinton Crosstown line, on, on half-hour, all-day uh, two-way service on the Lakeshore line, the biggest single transit improvement for people in the 905, Mr. Speaker. We're very proud of that. We hope the party Thank opposite you. will join us in supporting the financing. Thank you. The, the minister keeps on saying HOV, but you're really uh, proceeding with, the, with HOT lanes. These are the toll lanes we're talking about. The government made similar rosy projections when it rolled out Presto, but we now know that this private sector misadventure has been very costly to taxpayers. Experts say that building new high occupancy toll lanes costs more than 700000 per kilometre. That means millions will be spent to build 
450 kilometres of these lanes before they generate a dime. And that's if everything goes perfectly. Metrolink says we will need $2 billion a year in new money to pay for transit. Why is the government playing games with another risky, Question. costly and complicated new payment system for the sake of a mere $25 million a year? Mr. Speaker, I, I will speak very slowly so I'm not misunderstood. Mr. Speaker, we are expanding HOV lanes and we will be introducing Order. Order. Thank you. Finish, please. The member from Eglinton Lawrence is not using his timing properly. He's not even listening while I'm trying to get him to stop. I know how to do that if it's needed. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'll be very clear. I'll speak slowly. We are expanding HOV lanes, and we will be introducing HOT lanes. We will be doing that strategically on an evidence-based process, Mr. Speaker. We have the benefit of about 18 other projects going on in North America that Answer. are similar, and we will use that experience. But, Mr. Speaker, my question for my friend in the third party is, how are they going to pay for the commitments that both the Liberals and the New Democrats believe are critical? Thank Mr. You. Speaker, our Premier has been very candid. Thank you. We have a point. please. Time's up. No question. The member from York uh, Southwestern. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Community and uh, Social Services. Strengthening the social safety net is a very important issue to many people in Ontario. Those who have depended on social assistance in time of need appreciate the support it provided to them and their families. And I've heard that firsthand from constituents in my riding of York Southwestern. Others are simply glad to know that the system is there for those who may need it. However, many of us are concerned that social assistance as it exists now may not be delivering all of the results for the most vulnerable that it could be. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, the Commission to review social assistance in Ontario submitted their report to you at the end of last year. And I remember from earlier questions, you've answered that you've been taking the time since then to review the Question. report and to consider what actions the government might take to begin reform. Has the ministry taken to act on the suggestions thank you. of the report? Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member from York uh, Southwestern. Uh, uh, she is hardworking, in fact, and I want to thank. Uh, thank, thank I want to let her. I share, her, I share her concerns, and she's correct. We have been reviewing the recommendations, all 108 uh, from the Commission. Uh, to do that, we've been listening to a number of stakeholders. I think I've met, uh, my ministry's met with 64 different groups, wow. and uh, we're getting some good feedback. Based on all of that information gathering, we're investing 400 millions of new dollars over three years to uh, 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 support the increases in OW, ODSP, to also uh, provide adults, single adults with a $14 uh, um, a top up and uh, allowing social assistance clients to earn uh, as a work incentive and keep up to $200. And we're sir, also looking great. at assets, uh, uh, special provisions for First Nations and Northern communities, as well as simplifying rules, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Jobs, the economy, and affairs system. Senior, please. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the minister, it is encouraging uh, that this government plans again uh, to be raising social assistance rates for all recipients. This step can make a difference in uh, their lives, as will the increase in the earning exemption. While I recognize some of the items that you mentioned from the Lankin Sheik report, I believe that there was a lot more that was recommended. Mr. Speaker, uh, can the minister speak about what plans he has? for some of those other recommendations included in the report. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, back to the member. We're going to be working uh, uh, very closely um, and in a collaborative way with a number of stakeholders to move us forward. There were a number of things in the report that uh, groups said they didn't want to see us implement. 
So there are bound to be some trade-offs, and we need to be careful about those. That having been said, I think it's encouraging to know that this government uh, is about fairness and is about moving forward. I agree. Um, jobs, the economy, and a fair society are, of course, the government's top priorities, and reforming social assistance is a key part of that uh, priority. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that we will be working very hard. We'll be working together collaboratively, and we would invite all members to join us. And by the way, we can't do the kinds of things that we want to do for those who need special help unless we get the budget through. So let's get at it, folks. Thank you. Question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Good morning. My question is to the Premier. Premier, we've heard that the disagreement between you and your environment minister over the Liberal eco-tax programs has been so bad lately that you've personally taken over the file. After rejecting the PC plan last November to scrap eco-taxes and set waste diversion targets, the minister did an about-face last month claiming he was suddenly against eco-taxes. But he failed to present a real solution to eliminate them. Instead, he wants to continue to charge eco taxes while keeping them hidden from consumers. You, on the other hand, want eco taxes to remain visible to consumers. Premier, now that you're managing the environment portfolio, should Ontarians expect to still have eco taxes on their receipts? That's a good question. Premier, Minister of the Environment. Minister of the environment. As we have done uh, for some time, we have identified the real problem, and that some of the members, some of the members who are here for some length of time, who don't get a chance to ask questions for the Conservative Party anymore, the Wiley veterans, the great people who serve their people well, don't ask these. But they would fully understand. They would fully understand that the real problem is the Conservative bill that was passed from in 2002. It allowed for cartels to be set up to be able to charge these particular fees. We recognize, we've tried to work with your old bill. We've worked very hard on that. It's impossible. And that is why we'll be introducing a new bill to make the kind of changes people happen to believe are needed. So you should go back to some of your colleagues who are then who recognize how bad that bill was and encourage them to support the new Come bill that we will be introducing in this House that will in fact Answer. address many of the problems that have been there for some period of time. Thank you. You just want to keep so, the land. The Attorney General will come to order. Supplementary. Yeah, you know what? Um, those programs were introduced by this government, uh, and the true godfather of the eco tax, uh, the tax man himself, Dalton McGuinty. Right. Premier, we've heard your environment minister claim. I've reminded members in the past about this, and I'll do so again. We refer to people according to their writing or to their, their title. Uh, Premier, we've heard your environment minister claim on multiple occasions that the government doesn't receive any money from eco taxes. Well, he's totally wrong. The Liberal government has been secretly collecting its share of eco tax revenue for years at a cost of up to $100 million. According to Ontario Tired Stewardship's budget, right here, more than $8.5 million of hidden HST charges were embedded in the Liberals' tire tax in 2011 alone. And that number is only going to rise with the Liberals' more than 2,000% tire tax hikes that unfairly target Ontario farmers. Premier, do you continue to support eco taxes because you're profiting from imposing hidden taxes Thank you. on Ontarians? Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. The legislation that the Conservatives put in place allowed that to happen. Now we have implored, and I'm going to seek I'm going to Thank you. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, you're warned. Finish. I'm going to seek the assistance of some members of your caucus who may know this individual, the Federal Minister of Finance, and try to get him to change a system which in fact uh, allows for HST. But the bill has to be changed completely. What we should know is the real godfather of eco fees in this province your is your leader. Exactly. Yeah. Your you leader was the minister of then uh, consumer and business services, and he allowed eco fees at that time. 
Yeah. So when we're looking for godfathers out there of eco taxes, I think you should speak to your own leader. Thank you, my friend, Thank Mr. You. Hudak. Before before we move on, stop the clock. Uh, I will also remind the Minister of the Environment that we use people's uh, titles or their writing names. New question. The member from the member from Durham. The member from Bramley Gormald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2010, this government slashed, or everyone knows this, they slashed the benefits that our consumers receive in this province when it comes to auto insurance. This slash in the statutory accident benefits resulted in a 70% drop in payouts to the residents of the GTHA within one year alone. That's a 70% drop in claims payouts. Yet, over the past three years, these very same residents haven't seen a penny of savings in the form of lower premiums. How long does this government think that those residents should have to wait before they see a drop in their premiums? Premier. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, what we need to do is get this budget passed so we can start getting at the issue about reducing automotive premium rates. And I look to the leaders of the, uh, both sides of the House. So let's get moving on that. We've already identified that the cost of claims are much too high. We've taken steps necessary to try to reduce them. Some of those transfers are starting to take place. We need to give fiscal more teeth so that the regulator can start passing on those savings. We need you to act with us now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Later on today, the Premier is scheduled to speak in Brampton and make some announcements regarding the budget. I want the Premier to be very well aware that the residents of Brampton know that the 15% reduction in auto insurance does not have any timelines whatsoever. This is a serious concern. This means that people in, in the GTA or in Hamilton could wait two years, three years, five years. No one knows how long it will take. The benefits were slashed in 2010, that's three years ago. There's been a 70% reduction in claims payouts to residents of the GTA in Hamilton. How long does this government expect the residents of GTA in Hamilton to wait before there's a 15% reduction in auto insurance premiums? So, Mr. Speaker, the timelines will be dependent upon how quickly we get this budget passed. Exactly. The member opposite knows the complexity of the file all too well. We know that we need to take proper measures to help the superintendent uh, get the oversight and the authority required to ensure that the filings of those new rates take place. You know that we need to work with the industry to reduce the cost of claims. You know that in dealing with um, the industry and the players, they are now so receptive to taking those steps as well. Uh, but what we need is this legislation to pass so that we can act quickly. You yourself recognize that it takes a gradual approach to get at the cause. You put that in your private member's bill. We agree. We all want this to happen quickly. The faster, the better. So let's get on with getting this budget passed. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga's No. Thank you, Speaker. And today, my question is to the Minister of Innovation and Research. Oh, Speaker, yesterday, Minister Shirelli and I visited a company called Temporal Power in Mississauga. And as Ontarians, we can all be really proud of the fact that Temporal Power leads not just in Ontario, not just in Canada, but in the entire world wow. when it comes to storing technology in flywheels. Great local story. And it is companies like Temporal Power Speaker that are powering Ontario uh, to new heights economically and creating new jobs. And I want to know from the Minister of Research and Innovation what we are doing to ensure that Ontario continues to be at the leading edge of technology and innovation. Minister of Research and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Mississauga, Ms. Cooksville, for that question. Mr. Speaker, supporting research and innovation is a major priority for our government. Since 2003, Mr. Speaker, we have invested $3.6 billion in research and innovation. This investment, Mr. Speaker, has helped create 30,000 jobs, 75,000 people were trained, and also fostered 10,000 industry and academic partnerships. In our budget of 2013, Mr. Speaker, we affirm we reaffirmed government's commitment to research and innovation. Mr. Speaker, I am proud that our government investments of $100 million in the Ontario Brain Institute, which supports cutting-edge research in brain diseases, 
Mr. Speaker, we are transforming Answer. global challenges into jobs and economic growth. And even furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we are making better health care for Ontarians Thank and you. also quality of life for people in this province. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that update and for reaffirming our government's commitment to research and innovation. But, but Speaker, you know, research and innovation is great, but it's only useful if we can commercialize it to improve our economy and help our society. So, and to do this, we need to support our entrepreneurs. So, Minister, can you tell us what is the government of Ontario doing to help and support entrepreneurs? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud of our leadership role our government has taken in venture capital. With the success of the Ontario Venture Capital Fund, Mr. Speaker, we are partnering with our federal government and the private Stony sector Creek, come to order. With, with $50 million investment right Mr. Speaker, I, I in Venture Capital you. 2, uh, this, uh, this fund has the potential to reach $300 million. This fund, Mr. Speaker, will help to create the right environment for attracting investments to Ontario and also supporting innovation, creation of jobs and boosting our economy. Mr. Speaker, our recent budget will deliver a commitment on commercialization and innovation voucher. And this voucher, Mr. Speaker, is going to help small businesses and entrepreneurs yes, to reach research institutions in this province to solve their problems and also increase productivity. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking important steps Thank you. in order to support research and innovation. Thank you. Foundation of the Thank you. New question? The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On March the 5th, the Premier received a copy of the package from the municipality of North Perth concerning the industrial wind turbine project that threatens the community. It included a letter from the Mayor, the Municipal Consultation Form, and my letter of support. The Premier should remember it. It was about an inch thick, and I delivered it right to her, right here in the Legislature. I trust she has read it. But it's now over two months later, and we have had no response. My question to the Premier is simple. Sad. What was the very clear position taken by Council, and will she respect their will? Good question. I thank the member for the question. Uh, the member will know that the Ontario Power Authority has had uh, procurements, standing offer procurements uh, for renewable energy. Uh, and through that process, uh, Mr. Speaker, over the last uh, several years, we've created over 31,000 jobs. We have stated quite clearly uh, our speech from the throne, uh, and the Premier has repeated uh, that uh, we are looking uh, and working uh, together in a number of ministries to improve uh, how we uh, deal with the siting of uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, in the very near future, we'll have some new rules on the siting of renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it sounds like the Premier will not support them. Right. Yep. On this issue, the McGuinty Wind Liberals are showing no more respect to my constituents than they did in the gas plant scandal. And we also remember the throne speech, which suddenly claimed to understand the need for willing hosts on projects like wind turbines. While our councils have spoken, North Perth, West Perth, and many more have passed resolutions. They are, and I quote, this is not the willing to host order. for industrial wind turbines. And the Attorney Yet General. The Premier continues to allow the wind project in our area to move through the old, broken process. I also ask her, and, and, and so I ask her, when will you stop trampling the overwhelming will of our communities and declare a moratorium? And what part of a, and what part of not a willing host do you not understand? Here, 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 here. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister of Energy. Speaker, I'm looking for some leadership and advice from the other side of the house, Mr. Speaker. We just heard a very significant. Member from here on, Bruce, come to order. Dialogue. Uh, with respect to cancelling contracts. And the position on the other side is that the government ought not to be unilaterally cancelling contracts. And we now have a request from the other side to unilaterally uh, cancel a contract, Mr. Speaker. So I'm looking for advice from the other side in terms of how we deal 
uh, with the number of contracts that have been signed, Mr. Speaker, uh, for which there might be some objections in the community, as there was in Mississauga, as there was in Oakville. And I'm challenging the member to say, should we break this contract? The member from Renfrew, Mr. Singh Pembroke, will come to order, and now the member from Huron Bruce will come to order. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for seniors. Speaker, my office has been flooded by calls and emails from concerned seniors who live in retirement homes and supportive housing for seniors. They have been told that the physiotherapy programs that are keeping them healthy will be discontinued as of August the 1st. Dorothy Johnson wrote, and I quote, they just gave us this program to keep us healthy and in shape, and a couple of months later, it's ripped from beneath us. Can the minister assure us that Ms. Johnson, that her physiotherapy program will continue after August the 1st? Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you, Speaker. I, I think it's the member for the question. Let me say that beginning August 1, 2013, Ontario will provide more than 200,000 additional seniors wow. with a one-to-one therapy. We will provide group exercise classes and full prevention services as well as a speaker. This will be provided in long-term care homes, uh, local community centers throughout our province of Ontario. 92 physiotherapy clinics are delivering the service only today. But in enhancing access to exercise and fall prevention classes for more an additional 68,000 seniors for a total of 100. Wow. 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 Speaker, this is one way how we deliver more service to our seniors. Supplementary. Speaker, seniors living in buildings like Mohawk Gardens, a municipally run supportive housing building, will have no other options in their in-house physiotherapy is cancelled. The government can talk a good game about wanting seniors to stay active and healthy, yet they're about to discontinue a hugely successful program. Barb Wyatt wrote, and I quote, if this program is cancelled, I have no, uh, excuse me, Barb Wyatt speaking, has no other choice. I don't drive. I can't. Now I'm speaking. Stop the clock. I'll, I'll stop it this time. But it's very difficult to have the question put when somebody on the same side is heckling, and it's hard to, for me to get to the people who are heckling on this side if somebody on that side is heckling. So please keep it down. Finish your question, please. Speaker, Barb Wyatt wrote, if this program is cancelled, I have no other choice. I don't drive, and I can't afford public transit that frequently. What is the minister question. doing to ensure that seniors in retirement homes can continue to access physiotherapy? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, it's a fair, it's a good question, and uh, let me assure the members and every member of the House that there are no changes with respect to accessibility to the system or to the care that seniors are receiving in community care. Yeah, yeah. In home. As, as a matter of fact, Speaker, the, what's being proposed, the amendments that are being proposed, speakers, will give 290,000 more seniors oh. access to home care on a one-to-one -one basis in more locations throughout Ontario, and this is what we want to do for our people, especially living in, in nursing homes, in seniors' homes, in home care, and at home as well. Speaker, it's the intent of this government to provide more services when they are needed, where they are needed, to our seniors, and this is what we'll be doing. Today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Last November, I heard the Minister speak about expediting the technical consultation on fire safety improvements in residences for seniors, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable Ontarians. I was glad to hear this morning that the Minister announced the mandatory use of sprinklers in all retirement homes, nursing homes, and residences for the disabled. Can the minister please tell us more about what this will mean for all our seniors? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Personal Services. Speaker, let me say thank you to the member from Oak Ridge, Markham, for this uh, question. Mr. Speaker, last Monday I was very pleased to be with uh, the uh, Premier uh, to announce the uh, making of automatic sprinkler mandatory 
in residences for senior people with disabilities and vulnerable citizens, the first province to achieve that in Canada, Mr. Speaker. These changes to the fire code will include a phase-in of a mandatory sprinkler for all existing care residents and a retirement home with more than four occupants over the next five years, annual validation of fire safety plan, enhanced fire inspection and staff training, and fire safety enhancement for all new retirement homes. In closing, Monsieur Speaker, Answer. I wanted to congratulate the Minister of, uh, of Housing, the Minister of Seniors, the member Thank from you. Niagara, and the member from Hamilton East. Thank you. Supplementary. back to the minister. I'm delighted to hear about our government's groundbreaking announcement. Mr. Speaker, I know that our government has always been strongly committed to fire safety. We've required smoke alarms on every floor of homes. We updated the safety requirements for hotels and so much more. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what kind of input we received from the retirement home sector? Thank you, minister. Responsible for seniors. Minister responsible for seniors. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member from the remarkable member from Oak Ridge, Martin, for the questions. Uh, let me say, Speaker, that seniors in retirement homes need to feel safe and secure. By mandating fire sprinklers and enhancing fire safety measures, the winning government is demonstrating its commitment to the well-being of our seniors in Ontario, Speakers. But that's not all. The uh, 2013 budget, it's a document written with seniors in mind, Speaker. Yes. Increasing investment in home care and community services, helping seniors with low and moderate incomes in getting their trillion benefit pro uh, 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 program, yes, Speaker, on a monthly or on a uh, one yearly basis. <laughs> Providing 30,000 more house costs to seniors and others with complex uh, condition speakers. Is it, it is yes, uh, the announcement that it's about celebrating the positive result of a collaborative All process that puts seniors and other vulnerable Ontario in first yeah, speaker. Thank you. And I thank you. Question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the House are also hearing from Ontarians about the budget. And I'd like to share one story that we've heard. Andrea from Hamilton told us that people were, and I quote, tired of being ignored by governments that seemed more concerned with themselves, more concerned with their own political skin, with their own political opportunity, with their Time own political well being than they were with everyday people. Deputy Mr. Speaker, Speaker Andrea, from Andrea from Hamilton is 100% correct. People are tired of this government. So, Premier, will you call the PC party one of confidence motion today so that Andrea from Hamilton can, ha can have her wish a new accountable government for the people of this province? You see it, please? Come to order. Last call. The member from Halton is warned. The member from Barry is warned. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I think the member should be aware that in uh, several days from now, according to the standing orders, we will have a vote on the budget motion, which is a confidence vote, and uh, we look forward to that vote and uh, their participation in it. When the budget bill reaches second reading, for example, just one example, Mr. Speaker, that will be a confidence motion. When it returns here to the House for third reading, that will be another confidence motion. But again, Mr. Speaker, you know, I want to go back. The member from Pembroke. Uh, uh, like Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Finish. Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to again go back and perhaps the Honourable Member in his supplementary could an, uh, answer a question that we've been asking over here. Why did his party oppose the gas plants in the last election? Why did they campaign so aggressively? When will they put forward their costs? And answer. People ask him, when will their candidates appear in front of committee and why has it taken his leader weeks and weeks to agree? Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, it's funny that the uh, government House Leader mentions the budget. Let's see what Andrea from Hamilton has to say about that budget. And I quote, 
We want to see a balanced approach with a budget that's accountable to people, a budget that tackles people's concerns about creating jobs and growing our economy while helping them in their daily lives and balancing the books in a balanced way. Mr. Speaker, Andrea from Hamilton knows, the Ontario PC Party knows, the people of Ontario know that the budget presented by that government doesn't reflect the priorities of Ontarians because the priorities of Ontarians is not to waste $600 million on a gas plant scandal to save some Liberal seats. Premier, the people of Ontario do not have to be held hostage by this dysfunctional budget negotiation sideshow. Question. You can end the charade right now by calling our want of confidence motion. Will you do it today? Let's get on with fixing what's wrong with your government. Please. Please it, please. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the honourable member stands up, talks about the gas plants. And again, Mr. Speaker, we want an over on this side of the house why Tim from the Fort Erie area. <laughs> The, uh, the member from Halton. The member from Halton is named. The, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities come to order. You are warned. The Minister of, Tr the Minister of uh, Citizenship and Immigration come to order. And uh, before I finish, as much as everyone might think that's cute on both sides, I think we should still be respectful of this place, and by doing so, if we think we can skirt rules, that means that you're not trying to find the, the highest ground here. My recommendation clearly, again and again and again, is to use members' uh, titles or their writing. To try to skirt them is not what I call impressive. Finish your answer, please. Mr. Speaker, I think there's a lot of people that would like to know why the Leader of the Opposition so aggressively opposed the plants. And perhaps because it's topical, Mr. Speaker, we'd also like to know why the member from Halton had this to say to the Toronto Sun October 7, 2010. It was sad that it took so long for the government to listen to the people of Oakville. Yes, it was nice to see that decision overturned. Mr. Speaker, these are not complicated questions. When will we see PC candidates Thank here you. in front of the committee? When will they be encouraging their Thank colleagues you. to be there? Question. We're from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. This government has just wasted $600 million on Mississauga and Oakville gas plants. But apparently, you haven't learned your lesson. The government has now signed a billion dollars worth of contracts for refurbishment of the Darlington nuclear power plant, even though, according to the Toronto Star, you haven't even made a decision as to whether or not to go ahead. Why is the government continuing to waste public money on these secret energy deals? Mr. Speaker, there are two separate issues. Mr. Speaker, there's the issue of refurbishment of Darlington units, and there's the issue of possibly building new units at Darlington. And he's referring to something that appeared in the Toronto Star today, Mr. Speaker, that was totally referencing the possibility of new nuclear. And in terms of new nuclear, Mr. Speaker, uh, we should be aware of the fact, of course, that the New Democratic Party built 3,500 3, megawatts of nuclear during their term. Uh, those units are still in place, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the important thing is a decision has to be made on whether or not we're going to shut them down 
or whether they're going to proceed. And we're taking some very, very serious advice, Mr. Speaker, on new nuclear that's under deliberation. We're receiving the best advice possible, and that's we're right. not going to rush the decision. I assure the, uh, the uh, critic from the New Democratic Party. We're dealing with, with, with it responsibly, and uh, you. we're going to be proceeding. Uh, Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Hamilton Mountain has given notice of her dissatisfaction to the answer of her question given by the minister responsible for seniors concerning physiotherapy services for seniors in retirement and supportive housing. This matter will be debated next Tuesday at 6 p.m. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.